This is WBCR in Bloomfield, New Jersey. The time is 1131. Welcome to another edition of DIY World Improvement, the show that showcases individuals who are fixing the world one project at a time. I'm your host, Catherine Carlozzi. If you want to break the cycle of intergenerational poverty in the developing world, focus on the future mothers. That's the premise of the Girl Effect, an initiative of the Nike Foundation. www.girleffect.org aggregates some very interesting information to call attention to the enormous gender-based education gap in the developing world. Uneducated girls marry and have children earlier, frequently experiencing complications of or death in childbirth. They're more likely to get HIV AIDS, especially as many are forced or sold into the sex trade. A growing body of evidence suggests that if you educate these girls, they will earn more than 10 to 20 percent for each extra year of primary school and 15 to 25 percent more for each extra year of secondary school. And they'll invest that in their families and communities at a higher rate than their male counterparts, 90 percent of their wages versus 30 to 40 for men. They'll reinvest their knowledge as well, becoming community leaders. Educated girls tend to marry later, be healthier, and have fewer, healthier children. In fact, a study reported last September in The Lancet, a respected medical journal, indicated that in developing countries, maternal education has a greater impact on child survival than household economic status. It's also a more decisive factor than paternal education. The mortality rate for children under six drops 10% for every year of education their mothers get. Think about that for a minute. And even children of poorly educated mothers are less likely to die in areas where overall female educational attainment is higher. But in spite of the increasing evidence that girls are a catalyst for change, less than two cents of every development dollar is directed to the 600 million or so adolescent girls in the developing world. Among the people who understand the girl effect and are making a difference in one small part of the world are Alex Ball and Eli Shearer, two young men from Montclair, New Jersey. They are co-founders of the Sacred Valley Project, which provide indigenous girls from the rural highlands of Peru with education, skills, and resources to become leaders in their communities. Alex, a recent graduate of Brandeis University, has been leading service trips to Peru and Costa Rica since 2005. He's built houses in Costa Rica with Habitat for Humanity and studied the landless workers movement in Brazil. Alex has an intimate knowledge of the Sacred Valley that comes from working with local communities and the regional government in efforts to improve rural sanitation, install electricity in rural communities, and build infrastructure for sustainable economic development. Eli is a 2009 graduate of Wesleyan University with a degree in history. Like Alex, he's traveled extensively through South America. His many years of experience in working with children include serving as child care director at the World Fellowship Center and helping to organize a mentorship program that put local youth on the radio. In addition to serving as treasurer of the Sacred Valley Project and working in the dormitory, he taught English at a Peruvian elementary school. Eli's been back from Peru for a few months and is in the studio with me today. Welcome to DIY World Improvement. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I know you did radio in college, so this is sort of like coming home. I can tell. (laughs) You just never get it out of your blood, I know. (laughs) It's there with me. Eli, give us an overview of the Sacred Valley Project and what gave you and Alex, and I know you have other partners in this project, Mm -hmm. the idea to create it and and made you really want to do this. Well, I mean, Alex Alex was really the catalyst and, and made this whole thing happen. He had been, as you said, he'd been working in the Sacred Valley for many years, leading service trips and working with local communities. And his ability to create ties and be part of that community is, is incredible. And he was really became very connected to these communities, especially this one community called Sokma, which is um, out up in the highlands of the Sacred Valley. Uh, about a three-hour walk from the closest town. And he'd connected with this community. He had his goddaughter there, Maria Elena, who was graduating from elementary school, which there is a little elementary school in Sokma. He was talking to her, and she was saying how just that was the end of her education because there was no way to make it to town every day in order to get to go to secondary school. How far would that have been? We're talking about a three-hour oh, walk so each was, way. Yeah. Three-hour walk each way. And sometimes there is a road, and sometimes you can find rides, but not if we're talking about walking every day. Or the other option is living with in a house in town in something that's called the empleada system, where they're workers, and there's really very little time for study. And in exchange for being able to live in town, they're, fi- they're made to work, um, which is also not a recipe for success in education. So Alex was there 
was talking to them and thought, well, you know, what can we do about this? And started talking to the communities and talking about ways that this problem could be overcome. And he saw a lot of desire to help the young women of these communities. And they decided together that the best idea would be try to try to build some kind of dormitory inside uh, in the, the local town um, where these young female students could come live and study. And he said yes and came back to the United States. And that's where he found, that's where we started working together. We were working together actually at the World Fellowship Center, uh-huh. which you mentioned, where I was doing uh, child care. And we started brainstorming about ways we could raise money, ways we could come involved. And before I knew it, we had a NGO and started. So talk about the area, the Sacred Valley, its history, the people. Sure. The Sacred Valley is the ancient valley of the Incas. It is outside of Cusco, about an hour outside Cusco. Um, it's a big valley. It actually contains, it's where Mach- Machu Picchu is, um, but we're not very close to Machu Picchu. And it's the old, it's called the Sacred Valley because it was the Sacred Valley of the Incas. It's full w- of ancient ruins, of sacred sites, and it's just really beautiful, a valley with the mountains everywhere and these really old communities of people some we're talking about towns where people have lived continuously through generations and generations for millennia so some of these and probably most of these are descendants yeah yeah of, of the of the ancient mm-hmm, inca mm-hmm. anyone who's not been to peru they still very much hold the same rich uh, beliefs and culture and still very much alive and i assume that they also speak a language other than Quechua. Spanish. Quechua. A lot of the people we work with there don't even sp- don't speak Spanish. They're Quechua speakers. So tell us about the dormitory and how you know what it's like. What um, how you found some a building for it. What kind of support you're getting from the local community? Sure. I mean, the local community is everything. Without the local community's support and running of things, it, everything would be impossible. Um, the building we used last year for the dormitory was a community old building. So the community um, is called the Comunidad Indígena de, de Oyentetambo, Campesino de Oyentetambo. And it's set up much the way that Inca society was set up pre-Columbian, pre, uh, pre-Columbus. And they own land and try to deal with community issues within themselves. So we actually rented our building from the community at a price that, that, at a price that was way more within our budget than we could have gotten if it was not through the community. Mm-hmm. So they had a building that was being used f- kind of for a, uh, uh, I guess, how would you say that in English? Comedor, like a f- eating, communal eating place, but mm-hmm. it wasn't being used very often, so they offered it to us to rent that. And then the new place we're having also is this old school where we're moving into for the next year right now, summer vacation down there. Mm-hmm. But when we open again in March, we're moving to another community building, which is a... Uh, old school, which they are also renting to us for about $100 a month, which is something that wow, just, yeah, wow, can't find otherwise. So, I mean, their support is everything. And then plus, you know, advice, taking on leadership roles, doing, I mean, everything, everything from selection process. Uh, you mean selection of the girls? Selection of and the I girls. And I wanted to ask you about that because uh-huh. I know that the first year you had room for six girls, six girls. in the dormitory. Mm-hmm. And I understand that 20 applied mm-hmm. for the six openings. And were they from different villages? Different villages, yeah. And oh. how were they selected? Well, you know, we came and we were, were talking to the principals of schools and talking to different people. We decided one of the best ways to get out the word was we even just put out advertisements on the radio, you know, because that's for people living in high up in these communities, that's pretty mm-hmm. much some of the only contact they have mm-hmm. besides coming into town maybe once a week to go to market. So we did. We got a lot of we got a lot of interest. Interviewed a lot of girls and their families. And the first year we could have done things. Uh, I th- I, it was it was it was sort of a, a learning process mm-hmm. and how to do it. Mm-hmm. I think we definitely g- got a, gave a lot of girls a lot of hope that they were going to be able to come. Mm-hmm. And in the end, had to had to turn some down. 
when um, I when I read about that on your website, all I could think about was this the scene in uh, Waiting for Superman where the mm -hmm. kids and their families are waiting at through the charter school lottery drawings, right. and some got in and some didn't get in, and you could just feel. Yeah, and unlike Waiting for Superman, we did we had to actually go and tell them ourselves, and it's a delicate process because you don't want to. You want to have a system that's open, that's clear, mm -hmm. have your reasoning be clear, mm -hmm. and not create rifts within communities of why one family was given this opportunity and the other family not. Is, is there a rule that only one girl from each, each community? community? No. Oh, so there are... I mean, because that, that, that was something we, we thought about, but the practical and practicality, that makes things very complicated because you don't want one... Because the girls go home for the weekends. Oh, they do. They do. They go home for the weekends. We find that we, that's very important that they go home for the maintain weekends, their maintain contacts, their contacts. Right. You know, s I mean, they have family responsibilities still for the right. weekends. But you don't want one girl. You know, it's much safer to have two girls going home together yeah. than have one uh, on her own. I remember one incident in in particular where we I had to go. Uh, Bianca and I, who's Bianca is another board member. Who's working with us down there? She's, She's the great. house mother, isn't she? She, basically? she was the house. She was the house mother ah. for for a time when we were between hiring house mothers. But she's she really runs a lot of the educational policy and education in the house, and basically it's a motherly figure for the girls, but doesn't mm -hmm. live there. Um, Talk about what life is like for the girls during the week when they're there. They I know they go to school, but when they're not in school and they're just in the dormitory, sure. what are they doing? What's their typical day like? Well, they get home at around 2.30, lunch right away. Then, you know, we try, try to go straight to homework. Usually we give them about, well, clean up first, and then usually they have about 15 minutes of free time, and then homework, um, where we have tutors, volunteers who come sometimes to come and help, and sometimes we go to the library with some of the girls, but homework first. And homework, they have a lot of homework, so that'll take hours. And, and now these kids are learning in a language that's not their native language, right? right? So on top of that, they've got to learn Spanish. Right. That's going to be actually the, the new group of six girls that are coming in next year are way behind in Spanish than the girls we had last year. We're all, we're all, we're all pretty fluent. I mean, definitely stronger in Quechua. Mm -hmm. That's actually something, yeah, that we're looking now for a actual Spanish tutor mm -hmm. because a lot of these girls are coming from a background of really not speaking much Spanish at all. And if you're going to go to secondary school, you need to be able to speak Spanish. We really value the fact that they speak Quechua mm -hmm. and aren't trying to make them, you know, Spanish speakers for just the sake of it, but just because the high school textbooks and everything, and right. if you don't speak the language, you can't. So they come home, they eat lunch, they do their homework. Sure. They do their homework. Um, just like and kids then we everywhere. Have, right, exactly. But we, we do expect a little something out, more out of, out of our students. We have extracurricular classes every four days a week. And we try to make them something fun because, you know, sitting them down, having them do more math after a full day of math. Mm -hmm. It's a little hard. I was teaching an English class for a while. Uh, we had an art class, a computation with uh, two computers donated to us, which was great. And uh, we had a, a computer class going for a while. Mm -hmm. We also sometimes cooking. And you do some trips and treks with the girls, don't you? Well, they love hiking. We're just walking around there, and we have time, and there's not, not too much homework. They'll love going on just walks up around this beautiful trails all around where we are. We took, we did took one day, we took a trip to, a day trip to Cusco one day, which was really, really nice. Um, and I know that must have made little Catherine very happy. I saw in her <laughs> bio that it was her dream to go to Cusco. <laughs> so you must have made her very happy. <laughs> yeah, Kathy, Kathy was very happy. Kathy was happy. Um, they were all happy. You know, actually, they live only about a couple of hours away from, from Cusco, but uh, most had never been beyond the where you get your IDs, where you get your like official documents. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, uh -huh. actually into the real city. So they had a really great time there.
This is WBCR in Bloomfield, New Jersey. The time is 11.31. Welcome to another edition of DIY World Improvement, the show that showcases individuals who are fixing the world one project at a time. I'm your host, Catherine Carlozzi. If you want to break the cycle of intergenerational poverty in the developing world, focus on the future mother. Last September in The Lancet, a respected medical journal, indicated that in developing countries, maternal education has a greater impact on child survival than household economic status. It's also a more decisive factor than paternal education. The mortality rate for children under six drops 10% for every year of education their mothers get. Think about that for a minute. And even children of poorly educated mothers are less likely to die in areas where overall female educational attainment is higher. But in earn more than 10 to 20% for each extra year of primary school and 15 to 25% more for each extra year of secondary school. And they'll invest that in their families and communities at a higher rate than their male counterparts, 90% of their wages versus 30 to 40 for men. They'll reinvest their knowledge as well, becoming community leaders. Educated girls tend to marry later, be healthier, and have fewer, healthier children. In fact, a study reported, in spite of the increasing evidence that girls are a catalyst for change, less than two cents of every development dollar is directed to the 600 million or so adolescent girls in the developing world. Among the people who understand the girl effect and are making a difference in one small part of the world are Alex Ball and Eli Shearer, two young men from Montclair, New Jersey. They are co-founders of the Sacred Valley Project, which provide indigenous girls from the rural highlands of Peru with education, skills, and resources to become leaders in their communities. That's the premise of the girl effect, an initiative of the Nike Foundation. www.girleffect.org aggregates some very interesting information to call attention to the enormous gender-based education gap in the developing world. Uneducated girls marry and have children earlier, frequently experiencing complications of or death in childbirth. They're more likely to get HIV AIDS, especially as many are forced or sold into the sex trade. A growing body of evidence suggests that if you educate these girls, they will